Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today we're having a look at the new English language SDK for Spark. Essentially, the ability to write Spark in English. And I don't just mean the optimized statement with an S instead of a Z, as it should be spelt. I mean actually being able to just frame in natural language what you're trying to get it to do. So there's a new PySpark AI library that you can import, you can set up in any Spark environment, and actually start working with it. And there's a bunch of things that I can do from writing transformations for you, for actually building data frames by scraping websites, plotting out visualizations for you, loads and loads of different use cases for it, if you've set it up properly. So I started off on this little journey just going, ah, it'll be easy, I'll just click a button and turn it on. There's a little bit you need to do to actually get it working, but when it's done, it's pretty cool. You can have a play. So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna have a look at how you get started with the English language SDK for Spark. Now, quick reminder, there are a few other things we are doing. The Ask Databricks series, we're gonna be starting very soon in September. So do keep an eye out. We'll send out announcements probably next week and let you know when you can sign up, who all the various different guest stars from Databricks are gonna be and the various topics we're gonna to cover. So stay tuned. Next week, we'll talk a lot about what's coming up there. And also don't forget, we've just announced the Advancing Innovation Conference. So if you're in the London area, over in October, on the 3rd of October, I think, we're going to be having the AA conference. And again, if you're in the area, sign up. We'll send, be sending details about that soon. All right. If you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. But yeah, mainly, let's go have a look at this new thing, this new toy we can have a play with. So English and as the new programming language for Apache Spark. So there's a few things in here. The, the whole blog talking about these things, kind of like the advertisement. And this was announced at the Data AI Summit and they can did a whole big demo about it. But rather, let's dive into the GitHub version and then we can have a look at what we can actually do. So a few things that we need to know if we're getting started with this. Firstly, it's just a Python library. So pip install PySpark AI and then you can start using it. Well, that's the story. So they've got from PySpark AI, import Spark AI, activate it, and then it'll start working. Now, I didn't have that. So I, I found there was a couple of extra steps that you need to do to get it working. I'll tell you about how you actually get it working in a second. And then what can it do? Well, if we've got a data frame, we can say, well, transform it. Just, just write some logic for me. So I pass in a data frame, so data frame.ai, and then there's a few different things I can do, transform being one of them. And that'll essentially write some SQL for me. It's kind of funny how it works. We can tell you to go and scrape a website and then turn that into a table. I found that was a little bit flaky, but I'll show you what it looks like. You get it to write uh, some plotly uh, charting for us. We can get it to explain what's happening inside a data frame we've already got. So most of it tends to be, you've got a data frame, you want to do something with that data frame, you can throw this at it and it'll change that data frame and then give you back a data frame you can do something with. Pretty cool. So, okay. How does it actually work? How do we get started using it? So, I was having a play with it. Firstly, yes, I had to pip install PySpark AI. You could just install that on your cluster if you're always going to use it. It's up to you. So, that works fine. Install. Happy. I installed it all nice and happy. Uh, I then tried to run it like that, and that didn't work. So, if I try and run this, and I think that will probably actually work on my own, um, you need two things. So it needs to have an open AI key. So that tells us one thing. One, it's open, it's backed by open AI. So it's going to go and be calling that open AI web service to try and use one of their chat GPT models whenever you use this service. So there's a cost associated. That's a pay-per-click kind of thing going back and using that. Second thing, actually, it's going to default to uh, GPT-4. Now, on my basic little toy free trial version, I don't have access to GPT-4, so it didn't work. I think if I try to do this, if I try to do anything with it, it could give me an error. It's actually when I tried to transform it using that, it would go, no, you don't have access to the right model. So what I had to do is two things. Tell the Spark cluster actually what my API key is so it knows how to go and talk to OpenAI. And two, tell it to use a different model than the default. So it's not going to expect to see GPT-4. It's going to use the right one, GPT-3.5 uh, Turbo, which is one of the ones I've got access to. So be a little bit careful when you're setting up. It's not just as straightforward as slapping that code into a cell. One or two extra things you need to do. 
So API keys, so I logged into OpenAI. So I just in OpenAI, there's one thing, if I go to my settings, I've got API keys here. I generated a new API key and I took that out. So you need to have signed up to OpenAI. Go to platform.openai.com, sign up. There's a free trial. And I wasn't sure the free trial was working, so I set my one up. I think you can do this by the free trial, uh, but you do need to have created an API key. So I grabbed that key, and actually it's looking for that key against the, uh, the cluster. So on my single node, in my advanced options, you can see, oh, give my key away. I'm going to delete that key in a second. Um, you've got my OpenAI open AI API key. So you have to have an environment variable called that with your environment variable in there, and then it will automatically pick that up. So that has to be in your Spark environment for this whole thing to work. So number one bit of setup, go and do that. You can also pass it into the actual uh, Spark AI um, function when you first initialize it, but I found that a bit flaky. It didn't like it. But doing that and having it on the cluster worked fine. Then I tried to run it and it said you don't have GPT-4. So I had to do this. I had to bring in from langchain.chat models, the chat open AI um, class. And then from there, I could define my LLM. So that chat open AI brackets, model name equals, and then I just got that from the open AI list of models and usage I've got access to. I dived in there and went in going, what are my usage? What are my rate limits? There you go. It gave me all my different model names. So I'm like, okay, I'm trying to use that one. That's the one I'm going to plug into. You can see I don't have four in this list. I don't have access to four. Hence why I had to go and switch it down to 3.5. And that means I'm going to get different results. So in all the demos I've been doing, I've not been using the same chat GBT engine that they've been doing in the official ones that they've been showing you. So your usage, may, your mileage may vary. Do not worry. Um, just beware that this is using a slightly different beast than the ones that they've been kind of uh, training on and playing with. So, yeah. But after that setup, so slightly different than the doc, slightly different to what's in GitHub. Uh, so I created my LLM. I pass in that LLM as a parameter into my Spark AI um, initialization, and then activate it, and then we can start using it. Which is pretty cool. So, yeah. Set things up. You've got your environment variable for your OpenAI API key, so it knows where to call the engine. And it needs... A model that you've got access to. Cool. So at that point, we can start playing. So data frame equals spark.table, and I've just pointed it to a table. Um, that's in the old hive metaphor. I've not moved that over to Unity Catalog yet. And it's just a data frame, right? It is just saying, here's some sample data, go look at that data frame, and then we can do something with it. In this case, I'm saying, well, data frame.ai. That's now a thing that you will see you have, the data frame.ai. You now have this set of functions that you can go and do. So you can explain things, you can plot things, you can transform things, you can verify things. They're the main examples it goes through on the website. I'm sure they'll be adding more and doing more cool stuff. So if we say transform, so I want the product with the highest line total. And now number, number one, product. I've got product ID. It doesn't know anything else about product. There is another product table, but it doesn't necessarily know that. But I said product with the highest line total. It'd be nice and give it the actual name of the thing I wanted to sum. So here, that's a bit of a challenge. It's saying, well, I don't know how I would write this in PySpark. I don't know how I'd write that in SQL. Uh, AI, could you go and do that for me? So that returns, I've asked it to return me a new data frame. So, so make a new object, which is a result of data frame.ai.transform. Go and do this for me. And I'm saying display it. Now, anytime we're using this, anytime we're using the English desk SDK, it essentially writes out what it was doing. So it said, okay, it's going to, one, almost everything it does, it tries to do in SQL. It's generating SQL code for you. So the first thing it does is actually take my, take my data frame, creates a temporary view with a temporary view name, and then it starts writing SQL on top of it. So almost everything, all the code is generating is generally going to be SQL. So it's what it is. So it's going to query product ID and line total columns. Going to order by line total in descending order and select the top one row. Sure. That's going to give me the product with the highest line total. Now, maybe I wanted the sum of line totals, but then I should be more explicit in my query. That makes sense. Okay, so it's like they looked at it, went, okay, I think that's right. And now it's written out the SQL. So select product ID line total from its temporary view, order by line total descending, limit one, writes it out as a query, and then actually returns that as my my actual data frame, and then I've done a display so we can see what the results are. 
And that's its, its way of thinking. So it takes the problem, it restates the problem, it writes some SQL to solve that problem, and then it returns that SQL as a data frame. Essentially, it's done uh, data frame equals spark.sql and then jammed that text into there and returned it as a data frame object. So I've got that. So now, if someone wanted to understand that and said, okay, what, what's this doing? Traditionally, we'd do this, right? We'd get a data frame and do dot explain, and I get a lovely, oh, an execution plan. I can go and see what the plan is, what it's going to do. It's going to do a file scan. Then they go and take it and project it. It's going to do a sort. But if I'm having to use AI to write that, I'm not going to know how to read an explain plan. That's the other thing they've got. They've now got this my query, so my data frame, dot AI, dot explain. I can pass in any data frame and say, go and explain what this does. And so I have, because I've reran things, let me go and set it up again. I'm going to run this one that actually works. That's the error you'll get if you don't have access to GPT-4. And say, that model doesn't exist. Now that I've reset it and I've told it to use 3.5, it'll go through and do it properly. So this is going to send, essentially it sends that through and says, go and explain what that does. So it's basically translated the execution plan into something I can read. So it's retrieving the product ID and line total from the sales order detail record from the AdventureWorks database, and it's sorted by descending order. Cool. Yeah, it makes sense. So basically those two functions together are really, really useful. So dataframe.ai.transform, and then just give it something you want to do with that data frame. And it will write a SQL query for you that does it. And then dataframe.ai.explain, just give me a verbose description of what actions, what transforms this um, thing is going to do if I execute it. Cool. Uh, now this one. So dataframe.ai.plot. So I said I want a bar chart showing the top, top 10 products by sum of line total. Again, being slightly tricky. So products, again, it doesn't know what products are, except it's got product ID in there. Line total, it could figure out that line space total means line total, maybe. Now, this is actually writing some PySpark. So we could see I didn't have PySpark functions uh, in instantiated. So it's imported that, it's imported Plotly. It's made a grouped data frame that's going and uh, grouping my data. Cool. It's ordering it so it can get the top 10, right? Um, it's then doing a, a join of the ordered one back to itself so it can add some more data to it. Okay. Fine. It's then actually building out uh, a plot based on it. Now that didn't work. I threw back an error going, no, no, that 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 Python that you've written there isn't valid. So I was a bit concerned about that. So I took that, I took that Python, pasted it into a new cell, tried to run it. And it puts up the obvious thing going, well, name's not a real column. So in here, so it said, I want product ID and I want the sum of line total called total line. So the two columns I'm really working with, product ID, total line. And then here, when it decides to join back to itself, it asks for the name column, which doesn't exist. That's that's not a column. It's hallucinated a column name. Again, hallucination is really common thing with large language models. Um, and then it's put it in and it's assumed that that's going to be the name of one of my uh, columns. So that doesn't work. So those two pieces of having that name in there, no, got that wrong. And that's why that didn't work. Now... And then switched it around and said, okay, if we, if we actually switch that to be total line and we put total line in as the product name, um, there's also another error that it was coming from. It was pulling from a data frame, even though it had converted that into a pandas data frame. So I had to fix that as well. So it's now both coming from the pandas data frame, now getting total line, and it builds my chart. And that's not an impressive chart because I used something that was an integer as the name rather than treating it as a category. But it at least will build visualizations for me. Now... Part of that is to do with my data set. Part of that is to do with the complete lack of any documentation on my data set. Part of that is because it's not in Unity Catalog and doesn't have any extra descriptors to give it the best chance to actually make the AI work. But it's interesting. As one thing that's really useful that it at least gave me the Python it was using. So I can debug it. I can look at that and go, well, that saved me writing all of that. I had to fix two quick things and then it worked. I didn't have to write all of that code. So it's actively saved me a lot of time. For someone who didn't know how to write that code, would that have saved them time or would that have really confused them and not helped them at all? Yeah, I don't know. So it's interesting as to who's going to use it. Like that, that particular one where you have to debug it a little bit. Really interesting to see how it's going to work.
or if it's just going to get better and better and better and actually it was just a fairly duff example i was using don't know um final thing i wanted to go through is this create data frame and what this does is it scrapes a website and there's two different ways you can use it so the way they describe it uh in here we got it down here somewhere a little bit further up um if you've done a load of setup you can actually put in a google search they can just give it give it something it'll throw it as a search engine if that finds a table of data it'll bring it back as a data frame that's very cool i've not set that up yet um if you don't have that you can just give it any website give it any url of a website it'll bring it back and it'll try and turn that into a data frame for you now again i've had mixed results here so we can actually try it with that one in a second um, but in this one, so I was like, well, I want to try it just with a random thing. And obviously the most, most important thing going on, the cultural phenomenon is the Barbie film going. I was like, okay, well, that on there, it had some tables of data inside that Wikipedia page. So if we grab that page, go and have a look at it. So it's got a few things. We've got a table of data over there. A few things I would look at and see as a table of data. Loads of things kind of, especially Wikipedia has so many different headers and bits of information and references things that are actually a table structure, so many things it could have treated as a table. But when I actually run that and say, well, go and go and have a look at that and bring it back as a data frame. So it takes that URL, it passes the information. What it actually does is turn it into a SQL statement to select the data. Now, in that case, it's got the name of the film and it's got the year. And honestly, I couldn't figure out where that actually got that from this Wikipedia page. It's most likely something hidden in the header for the website that is table formatted and has picked that out instead of actually looking at the main content. But then what it does is basically takes that HTML and says to the large language model, just turn that into a SQL insert script. So that's not that useful to me. It brought back two things, title and year. Yeah, great. So I thought I'd do, do something a little, a little deeper. So I grabbed this website. I was looking around for something that just had a very obvious HTML style table in here. So a load of box office results, Barbie right at the top saying, okay, just, just get me that data and bring it back to the data frame that I can do something with. And I gave it that, ran it. You can see it hasn't worked, but it did a create and replace 10 view. It did a selector, grabbed out all those headers of those columns. Interestingly, it's got extra columns that aren't actually in this list. So things like, what do we have there? The release budget, the release running time that we, we don't have in this. So it's looking at something behind the scenes in terms of the code to actually pass out and bring it to me. Um, and it started, it does an insert for every single row. So it's essentially just hand typing out each of the different rows of data as a giant insert statement. That just kept going down and down and down and down. And it got to a point when it basically ran out of space and went, no, we're going to stop there. It got to that point and then went, no, that's where we need to stop now. And it got a SQL error for trying to create that view. So I think there's probably some things in terms of the size of the data, the amount of data. It could also be because I'm using ChatGPT 3.5. I'm not using GPT-4. So it could just be the model I'm using behind the scenes because I don't have access to GPT-4, isn't quite thinking about it in the right way, isn't identifying the table properly. But yeah, I've had mixed success with this one. I do want to try it with the one that they had in the example, just to say, does this, does this actually work in the same way with the model I'm using? Or am I going to get a similar thing? But either way, from what I've seen, generally it will write a gigantic SQL statement for you. You'll put that into a data frame and then you can start using it. But if you're trying to do sample data, if you're trying to just, if you had some source data that was in a great structure that it managed to read properly, and you want to each time to go and check that website and get the latest version of that data, you could absolutely use it to do that same thing. Now for me, I found it's generally not that quick to do it. So it was six seconds to go and read the one column. Doing this took 24 seconds to get, what, through 20 rows. So it's it's not necessarily that fast. Uh, so again, that managed to do all of that. It wrote all of that SQL and it brought it back as a data frame. That worked quite happily. So I've now got that as a data frame i could go and query that auto df brand sales we should go and say show me that but it's absolutely able to uh go and do it just be a little bit careful with the source i think it has to be quite 
a specific HTML style sources manages to pull the data out of, or it is going to be better with the different models you use. So yeah, interesting stuff. Love to look at different applications. I really want to try the transformation in some different scenarios. What I would love to see is just trying to use this for doing things like data quality rules and handling expectations and say, well, this column should be look like this. This column should look like this. This column should look like this. Going over it in a little loop and then actually using it as a business managed data quality. But I don't know how fast that's going to be because that still took 10 seconds to do the one transformation. That did include the, the Spark action, but it's trying to find what's the right balance. And also, if that's going back and calling open AI for each of those different loops, that's going to cost me each time I go back and call it. That is a click per time I run this. So really, really interesting. Loads of really, 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 really cool things in there. How usable is it in automation? How usable is it in engineering? Or is it more for an end user trying to explore the data, trying to experiment, giving them a helping hand if they're not that comfortable with their coding skills? Don't know. But it's cool and I want to play with it. So yeah, I mean, that, that is all I wanted to show you today. So PySpark AI, just a Python library, grab it from Pip. You need to have an OpenAI API key set up and installed on your cluster. And you need to point it at the relevant model. If you've done that, grab a data frame, write some transforms in English, and it'll work. Really, really, really impressive that it just works. So, and the fact that it, it manages to understand your data model, understand your data structures, and infer things around the semantics of the column names, really cool. But it might hallucinate. It might make some mistakes. It might, the, some of the functionality around getting data from websites sometimes works, sometimes doesn't work. But it's so early. It is a very early product. It's showing an idea, a concept, and that concept is very cool. So yeah, that is all I wanted to go through today. As always, do not forget to like and subscribe and let me know how you get on. Are you using the English SDK for anything? Are there some use cases I've not thought of that you're using? Let me know down in the comments how you want to use this, what kind of users, who's in the business? Is this going to suddenly enable that wasn't enabled previously? Really curious what people do with it. All right, so much more to explore. Until next time, cheers.